Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, when Josh called me and asked me to uh, preach, I was super happy. I'm finally in the big leagues here. <laughs> I spend a lot of time preaching to kids, and this is my first time preaching in a real church with grown folks. So I am a little nervous, but, but overall I'm excited. So um, first thing, uh, my name is Travis Budd, and there's my wife, Sylvia in the front there. And uh, looks like Carlos and Nico, my two sons, already snuck off. <laughs> so uh, we've been coming here since, I believe, 2010. And then you guys probably haven't seen us much in the last three years because uh, we work at a place called Edgewood Ranch, and we are house parents. So working as ha house parents, we're working with uh, at-risk youth, which is like the official term. I never really liked that term. Uh, but to describe them better, most of them are uh, angry, they're uh, undisciplined, and almost completely they're fatherless. So I want to take that time for uh, the fathers here to really hold your heads high for raising your children because uh, so many kids out there are missing that in their lives and it comes out in so many bad ways. And also, I want to take the time to thank any fathers that are raising children that are not their own and what a service they're doing in this world. So, uh, back to getting ready to preach and be my first time up here and everything. Uh, one, one positive from it is if I do a really bad job, we're leaving the country on Tuesday anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, our kids went home for the summer and uh, we're, we're getting ready to go to Mexico. My wife there, Sylvia, is from Mexico. She's from uh, the state of Jalisco. And uh, it's beautiful down there. I really hope to uh, show some pictures when we come back. I know growing up, I always had the picture of Mexico in my head from the Western movies. You know, the northern states where you just see desert and cactus and mesquite bushes and all that kind of stuff. But where she lives is absolutely gorgeous. It's uh, mountainous, kind of reminds me of the Smoky Mountains and uh, the big fields of agave. So you have blue fields, almost like something out of the Wizard of Oz. It's gorgeous. So we'll be taking a lot of pictures, and anybody's interested, we'll have to, we'll have to show you guys. So, okay. Um, we're in Fruits of the Spirit this year and kindness in the specific topic. So... Uh, we'll start with that. And what is kindness? And one of the things I want to focus on in kindness today is uh, it's small services that you choose to do and uh, relationships are built in, in those kindnesses. So we're doing the, the story of Noah and the flood here today, but I'm going to start a little farther back and uh, just after Adam and Eve's fall, and evil entered the world, uh, moving to uh, the murder of Abel by Cain. And uh, Cain was a farmer, and Abel was a shepherd. And for most of you, I'm sure that you know that, uh, that God accepted Abel's offering, but rejected Cain's. And this upset Cain. And uh, not too long after that, he killed his brother, Abel. And when God was looking for him, uh, Cain's, Cain's uh, response was, am I my brother's keeper? God didn't like that. Uh, and God cursed the ground for Cain and made him a wanderer. And even in that moment, uh, Cain said, I can't, I can't accept this. Uh, punishment. It's too great for me. And God still was willing to offer the kindness of uh, protecting him and guaranteeing his life. And, uh, and moving on. And of course, humanity grew and evil grew in this world. And, uh, and it just continued on a downward spiral until, and I'll bring it over to uh, Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. When mankind began to multiply on the earth, 
and do- oh, wait, wait, here we go. <laughs> when the Lord saw that man's wickedness was widespread on the earth, and that every scheme in his mind thought of was nothing but evil all the time, the Lord regretted that he had made man on earth, and he was grieved in his heart. Then the Lord said, I will wipe off from the face of this earth mankind, whom I created, together with the animals, creatures that crawl, and birds of the sky, for I regret that I made them. Noah, however, found favor in the sight of God. So as you can see, we had not been our brother's keeper in those times, and wickedness just kept perpetuating and perpetuating. So, uh, so God, he used the words, he used the words, uh, regretted and grieved. I mean, he was very sad at the way we treat each other, we treat the earth, we treat the animals, and said, I'm, I'm done with it. However, uh, Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord. And it says that Noah was a righteous man, blameless among his contemporaries, and Noah walked with God. So there was one that, that was just and righteous in his walks. And he had three sons, Shenham and Japh- Jace- Japheth. So um, God uh, warned Noah and told him to build an ark in order to spare. One thing that I noticed when uh, reading this is that, uh, is that uh, it didn't say much about his family. I always wonder how his family was, if they were righteous as well, or if God went ahead and spared them all just off the, off the deeds of the one man. So as a lot of you know, the, the, uh, he built the ark and brought the animals on, and the floods came 40 days and 40 nights in the, uh, uh, of rain. And then quite a long time after that for the, for the uh, water to recede and the, and the uh, earth to come back again. So what an apocalypse. I know America for the last hundred years has really been obsessed with apocalypse. I bet you if you guys think about it, you could think of many, many books and movies about the apocalypse. And so I think this is also a response to uh, how we feel when we see the, the evil in the world and uh, we're destroying each other. Some of the movies I can think of, uh, anything from Terminator, Armageddon, to uh, different books. And so this has always been a uh, topic with, uh, with us Americans. Um, can you imagine actually living through an apocalypse like that? And uh, sometimes I think when we hear these stories so much, even from our youth, we never really stop to think about uh, the weight that that would be to really live through that. And uh, how incredible. So after Noah had uh, uh, arrived on dry land, uh, God spoke to him and told him to come out of the... uh, come out of the ark, you, your wife, your sons, and your sons' wives with you. Bring out all the living creatures with you, birds, livestock, those that crawl on the ground, and they will spread over the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So he did that. And the first thing that Noah did in the passages is uh, he built an altar to the Lord, and he took some kind of clean animal and every kind of clean bird, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. So Noah's kindness was immediate, even despite all the trauma that he he had gone through. He he immediately thanked God. And uh, so I I think it's cool to think about the little offerings that God enjoys. And uh, it's funny coming back through all of this and reading a lot of these things. I probably identify most with Cain in these. And uh, it kind of makes me laugh 
And it, it brought me back to a story about uh, when I had just got out of the Marines. And, and I always thought of myself a pretty good person and, and stand-up guy and did all those things. And my first job that I was trying to get was uh, as an armored car courier. And so you have quite a lot of background checks. And one of the things in the background checks is you get to do a lie detector test. I don't know if anybody's done a lie detector test before, but uh, it was quite a wake up for me. It was, it was really interesting, almost, a, almost comical, because they start out asking you questions like, uh, what, what's your birth date, and, and what's your father's name, and those type of things. And then you ha it's only answer yes or no answers, how they, how they arrange everything. So, uh, when they started asking me all the questions, I, I found myself answering yes to all the bad questions. Because, uh, have you ever stolen money? Yes. Have you ever betrayed a friend? Yes. Have you ever lied to somebody that you've loved? Yes. Even to the point where they, ha they had a question if uh, you have ever sa helped somebody that was a ward of the state escape. And I had to say yes to that which is, <laughs> I couldn't believe that that actually, they would even think to ask that question, but I had friends when I was growing up that were in a group home and I helped them escape one time. So I couldn't believe that I actually had to say yes to that ridiculous question. <laughs> so of course you go through and you have to make the different statements for this stuff, and yes, I've lied, I've lied to my parents about not, not coming home on time, and, and yeah, I've stolen money out of my mother's purse, $20, and, and yes, uh, um, to all those different things, so it really put it into perspective that uh, even though you may think you're you're a good person, you're uh, they can get you. You're, you're, you've always crossed the line in every way. <laughs> so uh, bringing back to kindness, uh, it this was very comforting to me that that God really enjoys our little acts of kindness despite the fact that, that we're, uh, humans are evil from the get-go. And uh, God enjoyed the aroma of uh, Noah's offering. And just from, from the pleasing aroma to the offering, God said to himself, I will never again curse the ground because of man, even though man's inclination is evil from his youth. Right here. And I will never again strike down every living thing as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will not cease. That's a, that's a guarantee right there that we're not going to have a major apocalypse like in all the movies. And uh, that the machines won't take over. That we won't have to send our world's best deep core drillers up to blow the, the asteroid in half. <laughs> so we already have that guarantee. Just off of Noah's one man's righteousness and one man's kindness, God made, made a huge kindness to humanity. Um, God's kindness is back in, in these, and this relationship working with the back and forth. And as always, God gives way more than... Uh, we get back. Personally, with what we do professionally and, and working with a bunch of uh, angry girls and now boys, uh, you get very little back for, for as much as you pour into it. And uh, you always got to bring yourself back to ground when you start getting upset and think how little we give to God in exchange for how much we've received from him. Um, I can tell you it there, you have high times and low times when it comes to working with those kids because you're unpacking so much garbage that took a lot of years to build up. And you just really got to hang on to those little kindnesses, those little responses to what you've said or what you've done, and, uh, and know that you are making an impact in their lives. And then just hope and pray that, that uh, you will see that fruit down the road. Some of them we get it right away. Some of them walk out of there. Uh, completely changed and walking in a different direction. Most of them get out of there and fall flat on their face 
and then later on in life come back to the teachings that you've shown them. And uh, the, the love and the community that they've seen and the personal responsibility that you've led by example. So uh, those kindnesses are what keep you going in that type of a job, in the job that, that we do. And that's where the relationships are built. We spend so much time uh, correcting them that you really have to focus on encouraging their gifts and their talents and, and those things. And from the girls that we already had from several years ago that we stay in contact, they remember those, those small things. They remember those kindnesses. And of course, we remember the kindnesses that they've shown to us. And especially when they take their time out to uh, stay in touch or to let you know that they're doing well. So, wrapping that up, it, God's kindness to us and our need to be kind to each other. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, I am my brother's keeper. Um, you can tell through Genesis that uh, that's huge with God. That's huge with, with God about uh, taking care of each other. And that, even in Isaiah 58, it talks about an offering to God and the, the offering he really enjoys is our kindness to each other, our care for the poor, our uh, concern for each other. And, uh, but one thing from Genesis that it kind of leaves out is, is where he said, even, even though man's inclination is evil from the beginning, we still have evil in this world. And many of you know that, especially this week, with this city, that uh, evil is still very prevalent in uh, our day-to-day -day lives. And uh, that kind of leads me to uh, my happy thought. Uh, how many of you guys are familiar with Peter Pan? Oh yeah, me too. Peter Pan could fly on a happy thought. And uh, I have a happy thought that really makes me fly. And uh, especially in those times where you're you're feeling down on things when I was frustrated with the kids, where especially right before holidays, right before they're going home, they're a disaster. They're doing everything wrong. They don't care about cleaning. They don't care about being on time. They don't care about any of those things. All they're thinking about is going home. And you always get frustrated. And, uh, and you know, you start hearing them say ignorant things, and, and you're thinking, are they listening to anything that I'm saying? They're just going right back to their old, old ways as soon as they get the opportunity. But uh, I always go back to my happy thought, you know, just like Peter Pan, to keep me going again. And a lot of people will say it's like a, a life verse, you know. Everybody, a lot of people have a life verse, a verse in the Bible that really sticks out to them, that they hold on to, that they base their lives on. So mine would be uh, 1 John uh, 4.14. And we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent his Son as the world's Savior. And he's the Savior of this world. And that's my happy thought, that Jesus is the Savior of this world existing right now. And I really need that. I really need that. I love to hear about heaven, and I love to talk about heaven and the afterlife. But, oh, I desire some justice here in this world, some righteousness here in this world something that I can walk out of my front door in the morning and experience. So waiting on a bus ticket, it, it doesn't work for me. I always got to remember that it's right here and now, and it's already existing. And so uh, the times I'm most depressed is when I forget this, is when you let the evil of the, the world start consuming your thoughts, and, and, uh, and you have that despair. I know uh, I'm not the only one that feels this way. Uh, David was great. David was great in the Psalms at explaining this and, and his times of despair and his times of joy. And, uh, and David really has taught me how to pray and, and how to be in relationship with, uh, with God. So, as you all know, that last week has been really tough on our city between uh, that singer being shot and the Pulse nightclub shooting. And then if that all wasn't enough, I was working last week doing stuff and I come back in and, and Sylvia has tears in her eyes and she's talking about a, a two-year-old 
that got snatched by an alligator at Disney, the happiest place on earth. Um, and oh, my empathy was huge with that. I got my little boy Nico is 21 months old right now, and I'm about two years old. And just to imagine him being on vacation and getting him pulled in, uh, what horror that must be for those parents. And and uh, it just if we didn't already have enough. And then, of course, in this body ourselves, we've got several people that are really in a fight right now, uh, physically. And so it's easy to get down on all these things. And I haven't even mentioned the elections yet. <laughs> I'll tell you, in, in, our, in our culture, if, uh, if there's anything that brings out the worst in people, I really think it's the elections. I, I already don't watch the news very much, just because it, it, it just depresses me. But I do uh, get on Facebook, it, probably more than I should, just to see what's going on in the world. Because yeah, if news is, is news enough, you, you start getting it through Facebook. But even that right now, I, Facebook I have to stay away from, because there's just so much garbage that everybody's spewing on each other and arguing over things. And, and even in this time of mourning, just hearing the arguments back and forth about whose fault it was and what we can do, and, and uh, one side pointing at the other side, and, and it's just enough, enough. So I have to go back to my happy thought. I spent a lot of time in my happy thought in this last week that Jesus is Lord of this world. And so we, I really want to encourage you guys to uh, uh, try and flip, flip that mode of thinking in these times. Uh, sometimes I feel like a, like a fish and that's totally unaware that there's water all around me. And the water being God's, God's kindnesses and God's love and his mercy. And especially the impact that Jesus has already had in this world and is making even right now. So I would say, take a second to stop and think about what life would be like if Jesus had not yet entered this world and the impact that he's already made. Some of the words that we have in our language, like uh, war crimes, atrocities, genocide, the word empathy, or the word mercy, in our pagan cultures, in our Gentile cultures, would those words even exist without the impact of Jesus into our, into our cultures? It's, it's something to think about. Um, going back all through the Old Testament and just looking at uh, some of the different cultures that they talk about in the, in the Old Testament, being ancient e Egypt or Assyria or Babylon, Persia, did those words even exist in their languages? Because uh, they didn't operate on that. You know, the world likes to work on the we're the best and kill the rest, or at the least make them, <laughs> make them our slaves, exploit everybody to the max in order to, to benefit ourselves. You know, we have, we have plenty of that in our world and it's easy to point it out. But I think a lot of times uh, we don't even stop to think about the impact that Jesus has had in our society, and even the morals that have been established through Israel and through Jesus specifically, and, and the differences that it has already made. So, wrapping that up, Jesus is the savior of the world, and hold on to that impact. And remember that uh, he's restoring all things in this world. Armageddon's not coming, restoration is coming. And uh, hold on to that thought and, and fly. <laughs> so again, one more time, just before I wrap it up, I just wanna say that verse. And we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent his son as the world's savior. Thank you.